Hi, First Baptist Church. I have an important announcement that I would like to share with you. On Sunday, November 1st, immediately following our morning worship service, we will be having a business slash town hall meeting. We're calling it a town hall meeting because we have some important and exciting changes that are coming your way starting at the end of November. At this meeting on November 1st, you'll be able to ask questions and you'll get all the information you need about what's going to happen in the life of our church with regard to our Christian education programs. So please join us Sunday, November 1st for the town hall meeting. Good evening, First Baptist Church family, and welcome to tonight's edition of Spiritual Formation. We will be looking at Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 12. So if you have your copy of the biblical text, or you can turn there on your app right now, we encourage you to do so. Deuteronomy chapter 34, and of course we will be reading from the NRSV. So if you can download that translation on your Bible app, we encourage you to do so. Uh, as you can see behind me, we have the, the map of the world lit up. Uh, we have all but two lights that are on right now. So that means that we have raised $4,800 for missions. We still have one Sunday to go. Folks, I know we're going to meet that goal, but we still need you to give this Sunday to meet that goal of $5,000. I will say... As a staff, we are so impressed by your generosity. Thank you for giving to missions across the world, in our state, and locally through the food pantry. Uh, so, uh, Sean, as we continue to look at the intersection between Scripture and Deuteronomy 34 and Art, will you please read our text this evening? Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 34, starting in verse 1. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar, the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all of Israel. So I, I have to ask this of the text, and I know we're not going to get an answer this side of heaven, but how in the world was he able to live to be 120? Mm. I mean... Did he live on an old Dr. Pepper diet? Uh, did he take supplements his entire life? But I think that's a pretty good question. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the oldest living people is a woman, and she says that she drinks one Dr. Pepper a day, and that's her secret. Keeps the doctor away, correct? Yeah. Maybe he uh, was a member of the Unicoi County Y. I, I don't know. But for some reason, he's able to live to be 120, which is incredible. Of course, we know in old, the Old Testament days, 120 uh, was wasn't as old as uh, mm -hmm. as it as it is now, because people seem to live longer those days. But we follow the life of Moses throughout the Book of Exodus. I preached a sermon series on the Book of Exodus. We've looked at the life of Moses on Wednesday evenings. But we also find the Moses narrative in the book of Deuteronomy as well. 
Uh, and so twice in the text in, in the Old Testament, uh, we're told that Moses has died. Well, uh, in this particular version, we, get, uh, we come to the book of Deuteronomy. Moses uh, is about to enter the promised land. This is what he has lived for for his entire life. Uh, this is his crowning achievement would be able to lead the people into the land of promise, and yet just before he's able to cross the finish line and collect his gold trophy, God says, no, you, you can't enter the promised land. And that's where he dies. What was going through Moses' mind as he's right at the finish line and God says, you can't lead the people? What do you think? I think there's sure to be some, you know, frustration, maybe disappointment um, that Moses has come this far and he's taken God's people through so much and he knows that this is what's promised to them and God even shows him like from here to here and as far as you can see this way is what I promised you, but you can't, you can't go in yet. Um, and you, you're not going to go in. Well, because Moses had to do the dirty work. Right. So he is the mediator between God and God's people, and God is always angry, understandably so, with the way his people were behaving. And so Moses would, would go back and forth. Moses did the grunt work. He, he led this ragtag group of people through the wilderness all the way to the promised land, and, and God says... This is not for you to do. In my doctoral dissertation, I wrote my dissertation on uh, equipping young leaders for ministry. And in one chapter of the dissertation, I focused on this particular passage. And so I, I did an exegesis of Deuteronomy 34 because really, to me, this, this is a passing of the torch. This is an example of what it means to be a leader. Uh, what's, what's the song? You got to know when to hold, hold them, them and know when to fold, fold them. them. Okay? Uh, you probably never thought I would use a Kenny <laughs> Rogers illustration on a Wednesday night. But I, I think this is a great example of that. Um, part of being a leader is knowing when to hold them and knowing when to fold them. It's, it's knowing when your season of leadership is done. But before that time comes, you have to be preparing those young leaders to take your place. Mm -hmm. Because leadership is seasonal. And I think we see Moses does an exceptional job with this. We just talked about how disappointing that must have been to, to get to the finish line and not be able to cross but you notice in the text, Moses doesn't complain to God. Mm -hmm. Moses doesn't seem to shed a tear. He doesn't go to God and say, well, that's not fair, God. I, I led all of the people through the thick and thin. I did the grunt work, and now you're going to let Joshua take them. I think that, that Moses does an excellent job of preparing Joshua to take the lead. Yeah. What, what, what does this passage tell us about good leadership? Uh, you know, I think you said it well. I think one of the best signs of a good leader is um, always preparing that person to take your place. Uh, and, and, you know, we hear that and we get scared, especially in, in the climate that we live in America where um, we've always got to have a leg up on somebody. Uh, and so, you know, I, I know from personal experiences, sometimes we want to to hold back just a little bit. So we'll teach somebody everything we know except for one thing. So they have to be dependent on So that on they you. still rely on yeah. us to do that one thing. Um, and we're not willing to show them everything. We're not willing to um, put them in a place where if, if I'm gone tomorrow for good, that person can step in my shoes and just go on and, and never look back. Um, there's always a learning curve. And so I think the, the signs of a good leader we see right here, um, you know, it, it says there was never anyone else like Moses in all the land. Um, and so 
even though Moses had done all of these um, well, and signs if there's, and wonders. If there was anyone who, who had the capability to lead them to the promised land, it was Moses. Mm-hmm. And yet he still knows, I have to prepare Joshua yeah. to lead him instead. So what a humbling... So, so part of being a good leader is, is humbling yourself, is it not? And knowing my season is not going to last forever. You, know, we, you and I have talked regularly about, you know, I, uh, those of you who worship with us on Sunday morning, you know that Sean takes a very integral role in our, our morning worship services. And, and I tell you quite often, the reason why I want you to take that role is I'm preparing you, for example, if you do want to go into pastoral ministry, I'm preparing you to be able to do that mm-hmm. um, because I want you to succeed. And Moses understands that, I believe. He knows his time is, is seasonal. In verse 9, he lays his hands on Moses and Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom because of that. And the Israelites obeyed Joshua, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. So again, there's no, there, there appears to be no friction. And maybe the, the, the writer just doesn't tell us this, but it, it appears, based upon what we have, there appears to be no friction. It's, it's Moses... He's passing the mantle of leadership, and he's doing that by laying on his... It's like, a, uh, it's, it's like what we see in a deacon ordination, yeah. where, where we place hands on people and we pray for them, giving them a charge. It's, it's we're giving them uh, the, the mantle of leadership for them to continue. And then someday they'll, those new deacons will place their hands on another crop of new deacons. Yeah. So, uh, Moses is completely affirming of Joshua. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to just reiterate verse 9 again. Joshua, starting from the end of verse 9, Joshua is doing what the Lord commanded Moses. And the people obeyed him because he was doing the work that Moses had been commanded to do. And then it says Moses laid his hands on Joshua and because of that, Joshua was full of wisdom. So, so we see this where things are falling in place for Joshua. And, and you know, we just mentioned a few moments ago how a good leader prepares that person to step in seamlessly. And, and this is exactly what's happening right here in verse Well, there, there has to be mutual humility. Mm-hmm. So on the current leader, there has to be the humility to know I'm not going to be here forever. It is uh, one of, it was a task of, of, of the leader to prepare the next generation. So it's my task to prepare the next generation of ministers like you. But it, there also needs to be humility on behalf of the mentee because the, the mentee has to understand I don't have all the answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think Joshua understands that. He had to wait for his particular season of, of leadership and ministry to happen. Yeah. And, and I'm sure even at this point, when Joshua is put in this position, he probably still doesn't feel like he has all of the ready. answers and he's ready. And, you know, so, so that humility goes on even after he's been put in that position of power. And then it again transfers over once he is done and he has to pass the torch. So... There's a reason why pre-COVID, and hopefully, fingers crossed, when life gets back to normal, when worship gets back to normal here on Sunday mornings, but there's a reason why our young people take such uh, a role in our morning worship. Mm -hmm. is because uh, we are passing, we're preparing first, but we're passing on that mantle of leadership like Moses does with Joshua here. Let's, Let's look at our painting uh, it's, it's painted by Walter Rain in 1949. The title is, The Lord Showed Him All the Land. Uh, so you, you have to wonder, is this Moses in the painting, or is it Joshua? I tend to think it's Moses. Mm-hmm. I, I tend to think Moses is at the finish line, 
God is showing him the land of promise, but it's here at this point when God says, but it's not your job to lead the people. Mm -hmm. You have prepared Joshua to take over, and that's who's going to lead the people. And and so the, the humility, maybe the disappointment, maybe the realization, finally the realization, leadership is really seasonal. Yeah. And, and Moses comes to understand that. And I think, too, Moses probably feels a sense of relief here. Um, probably the best comparison that we can make in modern day is going on a difficult hike. When we start the hike, we're full of energy and we're good to go and we're talking. And then as it gets hard and as the elevation starts to change, we breathe harder. Our conversation becomes less. That sounds like the other day get, with us, correct? Exactly. You uh, and puffing. Yeah. <laughs> and we get, we get tired. Um, but then as soon as we reach that peak and we're looking over what it, whether it's a, sense a, of a waterfall or a gorge or whatever it is we're looking at, there's just a peace and an accomplishment um, that it. just floods over you. And, and even though here in this situation, Moses is not going to be in the land with the people, uh, I think he's still going to feel that for his people. Because he brought them to that point. Yeah. And I, I would hope that as we someday in the long future come to an end of our ministries, that we will feel the same. We will be able to look out over the people we have pastored and, and the, the people we have prepared for leadership, and we will feel that overwhelming sense, sense of accomplishment and, and knowing, look, we're not going to be able to lead them into the promised land anymore, but we prepared others to do so. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Sean, for the wonderful discussion on uh, what it means to be a good leader, particularly in the, the context of church. Will you pray for us? Yes. Please join me in praying. Father, we just take this time to thank you for giving us a place and a platform to worship you, to study your word. God, we ask that you would just be in our communities uh, as we move forward through our weeks and our days here on this earth, that you would be with us, you would encourage us, you would give us a light to encourage others. God, remind us um, that it's not about me, it's not about my authority, it's not about my leadership, but it's about what you're doing in the lives of others around us. And God, uh, when we get to that place where we are looking back at our lives um, we just pray that you would um, encourage us right now to be able to stand at that place and say, God, you worked wonders and you were such a blessing to us, which allowed us to be that to others. And it prepared leaders, some of them that we will never know, uh, to step up and take our place once we're gone so that your word can continue to be spread and your love can continue to be spread um, right here in the heart of Irwin. We pray all of these things in your name. Amen.